Now, perhaps you have noticed in the demos outside and some of the talks about, well, we have all these HP switches that do open flow. Entire engineering school at Stanford is running an open flow network based on HP switches. Where did these HP switches come from? Well, our next speaker, Charles Clark, has been responsible for the development of these actual switches. He comes with a PhD in computer science from Utah, but he's been a very hands-on researcher looking to take the technologies, again, out of the lab and into the market. Um, he's also taken a lot of looks at, uh, well, how do you get it there in existing networks? So uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say on that subject as well. Please welcome Charles Clark. Thank you, Guido. All right. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Excellent. So OpenFlow is a very exciting technology, and it's exciting because it took a control plane, a data control plane, that was fragmented and that was dispersed and did some great things to it. You know, it was fragmented and dispersed. It was dispersed in the sense that we had many different control planes operating on the network at the same time. We had bridging, forwarding, ACLs, you know, and, and you can keep on going through the list, multicast and so on, all of these separate control planes operating on the network at the same time. It was dispersed also in the sense that most of these protocols were implemented as distributed protocols. And so you could go to various uh, devices in the network and you wouldn't find the complete you know, instance of that, of that protocol. You'd find a portion of it. And even if you did go to one of the devices and look down inside of it, in a device in the network and looked at it, what you'd find is inside flow control was fragmented inside also. We had ACLs, we had QoS, we had poly-based routing, poly-based forwarding. You know, you go down to the list of different things that you could configure on a switch, but you configure them out each maybe somewhat differently from each other. And so what OpenFlow did, and what it allowed us to do, is to consolidate the flow control into a single API. It also is, uh, it complements existing technologies for discovery, for management, for uh, monitoring, and so on. And then finally what it did was it helped, it enabled us to centralize this flow control, you know, into a controller if we'd like. And there's a lot of applications for this technology. There's a, a certainly, a, you know, we can use it, we've heard about it, we can use it in research, we can use it in campus lands, we can use it in traditional data centers and, and public and private cloud service provider networks and so on. A lot of opportunities for it. What I'm going to focus on today are two topics. One is talk a little about research and what we've been doing in terms of enabling research with OpenFlow. And then the second is to talk about campus lands. And, you know, why did, you know, so I was a director of research about four years ago, and, you know, why was I interested in OpenFlow? And there were two reasons. One was I thought that there was an opportunity to learn something about networking that hadn't been done before. What can we do with this idea, this raw idea? And the second was, could we use it to enable research to come up with other ideas for networking? So really you know, foster an environment where we could get more research, especially with respect to campus lands, because that's kind of my, my favorite topic. And so in, in 2007, started with, uh, with Nick and, uh, and Martine and started uh, talking about OpenFlow. And by 2008, we had an OpenFlow switch and implementation. We had demoed it at SIGCOM. Um, and this was all through a lot of work with uh, people in HP Labs. Um, and, and then we went through a couple years of doing some really good research internally in HP Labs around how we could apply OpenFlow to problems in various areas. Uh, you know, HP is involved in all those areas I listed, you know, the data centers and campus lands and, and whatnot. And so we had a lot of research going on that. But at the same time, the key thing we want to do is to enable research outside of HP. And so what we've done, uh, what we did then at the time was to create an OpenFlow enabled switch that, would, that we would offer then to researchers for them to create uh, their own ideas and innovate um, within networking. And currently we have, uh, we have uh, on the order of 60 uh, deployments worldwide. A little map there showing you kind of where these, where these deployments are across the, uh, across the world. And, and so, you know, there, I think there's a lot of uh, excitement and certainly a lot of uh, uh, excitement f uh, for me around how much uh, we've been able to help in terms of enabling research and I look forward to all the results. And in fact, I was very impressed with the results that were presented this morning uh, by the researchers and I continue to look forward for, uh, for more results in the area. 
about, about a, a couple of weeks ago, I did a survey and asked uh, these, uh, these people that are using our equipment you know, that, about their experiences with it. I wanted to share a couple things with, um, uh, that I learned of that. The first thing is that most of the uh, deployments uh, currently are test beds. They are not production networks. There are a few production networks in the, in the mix, but 90-something percent are uh, test beds. And the second thing is that there was basically an even split around whether they're using the switch as a pure open flow switch or whether they're using the switch as a hybrid switch. A hybrid switch being a switch that you're using both the kind of traditional protocols or, or features in the switch in addition to uh, open flow, you know, using both concurrently. And then I asked a couple questions. Uh, I want to share uh, just, a, just a, a two of them uh, with you now. Uh, and the first one was what's missing from open flow? You know, what would you like to add to the, uh, uh, to the protocol? And that's the capabilities missed, uh, uh, missing list here. And, you know, and as I looked at that, I thought, well, this is, this, is, this is good. You know, really what the focus is on is around expanding that match action pair, you know, making it richer, being able to match on more things, being able to take actions on, on more aspects of the package. And there was also a, a comment about fault trials of scalability, which, which I think really, uh, you know, something about how the, the switches interact with the controllers and whether there needs to be something specification. I think that's where that came from. The other question, another question that I've uh, presented here for you uh, that I asked was, what were the problems that you encountered when you were deploying an open flow network in your test bed? And, and as I looked at the answers to, the, to, the, to that question, there were the kinds of things that, that actually I, I, I thought were good. It was, it was really, there was a focus around, you know, getting it to work. There, there was some loop avoidance with non-hybrid switches. Well, that's, that's because, you know, their, their engineering isn't, isn't quite there in terms of uh, their controller, you know, creating a loop path in the network. Or benchmark, benchmarking for release. These are kind of engineering things. We're figuring out, what do I need to do to, to really qualify my controller and make sure that it works? Uh, and, and certainly troubleshooting and things of that, that nature. So there really were around kind of engineering aspects that I think we need to iron out, um, but I think um, it's good to see some good focus and uh, progress in terms of you using OpenFlow um, in a test bed and coming up with new ideas. So what I want to do now is to switch and talk about campus lands, because I think this is the, the, the topic of the, uh, this panel here, and how uh, those can benefit from OpenFlow technology. And first, I think we need to start with what are the challenges of a, of a, of a campus LAN. What do I mean by campus LAN? It certainly is a, a, a campus LAN like the, uh, the one that David talked about in Indiana, which is a, a large campus LAN. There's also smaller campus LANs, maybe the school district uh, campus LAN that uh, maybe your children uh, uh, you know, uh, attend a school in a, in a school district that, that is small on, on that order. So there's a, there's a range of, of sizes and scales uh, for campus LANs. But there are some, uh, there are some challenges that, that each of these campus lands are facing. The first one is that there is a, a greater diversity of users now than there were before. Um, uh, network operators would like to allow partners or visitors to be able to use the uh, network uh, while they're visiting the campus land. There's a fragmented perimeter uh, where, you know, people are starting to bring their personal devices uh, to work and expect them to work. Uh, to, to be able to operate within that network. And, and so at this point, the, uh, um, the, the network administrator doesn't necessarily you know, have control over those, those endpoint devices that the users are using. Uh, they'll be connecting via wireless uh, more and more today. Many uh, uh, new personal devices don't even have an Ethernet jack on them. Uh, and, and so you really uh, are going to connect wirelessly with those devices. And then there's various uh, other you know, inputs and outputs in terms of using the internet or using cloud services. And so this, this perimeter is being fragmented for the enterprise network. And then the third thing is that there are new services being introduced. These services could be uh, video conferencing or, or, or voice over IP and things like that that have you know, maybe different attributes or different requirements than what previous applications had. It's not just a database in the back end. There's actually more going on in the network, and, 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 and these, these, these new applications of the network have uh, different requirements. And so how do we deal with that? And, and the end result is that what happens for a network administrator is that things are a lot more complex, and with that complexity comes great risk that the network may not work or may not deliver the service that the, uh, that the company needs. And so what, what, are we, what are we doing about that? Well, what we've done is we've created an architecture, and I think that you'll actually see uh, some similarities to other ideas that, that have been presented earlier in the day, because I think there's a lot of minds that are thinking uh, similar things here. 
an architecture that has a infrastructure layer at the bottom. These are the switches, the routers, the access points, the security and, uh, and application services. A control plane in the center, and the purpose of that uh, control plane is to abstract or to virtualize that underlying infrastructure and present up a virtual network upon which uh, um, a virtual service networks, as we call them, um, uh, run on top of this virtualized network. And I've got a, I've got a slide here that's going to show uh, an analogy. No analogies are, are perfect, but I hope this one will help kind of elucidate uh, the, the idea here. And the analogy is with server virtualization. So on the right, you'll see this, this little diagram, analogy with server virtualization. And at the bottom, we have a server. We have the CPU, the memory, and so on, those components, that infrastructure, if you will, of the server. And then on top of that, we've layered a hypervisor. And then on top of that, we've placed virtual machines. And each of those virtual machines think that they're running on their own server. I've got my own server below me. The hypervisor's provi uh, provided that illusion that each virtual machine is running on its, own, on its own server, right? And then we have some management software on top of that that helps orchestrate that all together. Now, if you translate that, if you bring that over to networking, you know, what does that mean? What that means is you've got a physical network infrastructure below. That's like the CPU and memory. Instead, in our case, it's switches and routers and APs and so on. And then we have a control plane, similar to a hypervisor, that's going to virtualize those resources and present up a virtualized uh, uh, switching network. And then on top of that, we're going to place virtual service networks, which can be logically, logical purpose-built networks for a specific application or set of applications. And we can layer those on top, and then of course on top we have a management application to help orchestrate all this together. What this allows us to do is reduce the complexity of managing a network by allowing us to set policies at a high level to create those virtual service networks, which are essentially policy statements. And that is translated down into device configurations through this virtualization layer. And when we decouple the physical from the logical, we get a lot of power. We get power in the sense that we can change the physical infrastructure and not need to change our policies. Or likewise, we could change our policies without having to change our physical infrastructure below. We've decoupled the two and we've enabled some power uh, that we haven't had previously. And this is the application that we're looking at for um, um, really taking advantage of SDN and, and OpenFlow technology. Of course, our, 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 the connection between the control plane and the physical infrastructure is, of course, you know, would use OpenFlow um, technology in it. I just had a, a few closing comments. Um, uh, and, and, and the key idea here is that, is that as OpenFlow evolves, as STN evolves, we need to make sure that it remains relevant. And I, I talked, I mentioned hybrid switches earlier. And one of the issues that we'll have in terms of campus LANs is that enterprise customers, campus LAN uh, network administrators, won't tolerate uh, a forklift upgrade. They're not going to go replace all of their equipment. Unfortunately, we can evolve and move towards a uh, SDN uh, technology and, and provide that into these customers through an incremental way. I talked earlier about how we've got these different control planes operating on the network at the same time, this L2, L3, ACLs, you know, and, and so on. And what we can do with a hybrid switch is we can start to pull in some of those various control planes into one and start centralizing them. We don't need to bring them all in at once, but we can start bringing in the important ones initially and start folding in those more and more to where we get you know, a, a better solution, reducing complexity through bringing those into the control. And then at some point, you know, we can make a shift where actually it is all open flow control and, uh, and SDN. But in the meantime, we've been able to allow customers to evolve and to migrate towards this model without requiring them to, uh, to do a, for, uh, a forklift upgrade on their, on their network. Um, and the key things uh, involved uh, in, in, with respect to the OpenFlow protocol is that we need hybrid switches, of course, we have today in a forward normal operation, that that action is a, is a key thing that we need um, in, in the standard. All right, so that's, that's the presentation. Thank you.